Welcome to a special crossover episode of Locked on Wild and Locked on Penguins, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making both Locked on Penguins and Locked on Wild your first listens every day. And just as a reminder, both shows are free and available wherever you listen to podcasts. On today's crossover episode, we preview the matchup between the Wild and the Pittsburgh Penguins on Thursday night. We look at the return of an old friend from the Minnesota Wilds perspective in Jason Zucker and look at why the Pittsburgh Penguins are having such an under-the-radar season despite all the success. My name is Seth Topal, host of Locked on Wilds, joined by the host of Locked on Penguins, Hunter Hodes. And Hunter, we'll dive right in to some Pittsburgh Penguins talk to start things off. And I want to go right into that topic Because I saw you tweet this earlier today in that the Penguins, they have 90 points. But it seems like a lot of people are, it it seems like a season that's flying under the radar with the success that, say, Florida's having, Tampa Bay, Boston. You know, all those other teams that are a couple of points ahead. Just how good of a season is Pittsburgh having this year? You know, I think the Penguins are, you know, they're kind of a perfectly kept little secret. Um, you know, they're not Colorado, maybe they're not Calgary, Florida, Carolina, but I'd say after those teams, the Penguins are in that five, six, seven range. And I think that's totally fair and fine to say, you know, they've had a little bit of a rough patch lately. They've lost three of their last four games, but, um, overall the, the body of work, their underlying numbers are really strong. They've gotten excellent goaltending from Tristan Jari this year, which is what they did not get last year. Sidney Crosby just notched his 17th. A uh, season of a point per game. He's now two away from tying Wayne Gretzky for the overall record with that. Um, and, you know, Brian Russ plays at a point per game pace. Jake Gensel is over 30 goals. Um, the depth has been really good this year. Defensively, they've been mainly fine. And, you know, this is probably the deepest they've been um, since their Stanley Cup years in 2016 and 2017. And, of course, they're coached by a top three coach in hockey and Mike Sullivan. Um, I would put him up there with both John Cooper and Barry Trotz. Um, he is a master uh, coach um, in this game, to say the least. So, um, you know, the finishing ability, I think, has probably been one of their biggest concerns just because they get a lot of chances, but they're not putting the puck in the back of the net. Um, But, you know, the process has been there all year. It's just about getting the results. And, you know, they've gotten results, you know, a good amount of times. This is, I believe, the 14th season um, in the Sid Gino era that they've gotten 40-plus wins um, that's the most of any other. That's the most of any other team I think in the salary cap era so far. So um, this is the team I think that's definitely capable of making a deep run. But you know the biggest thing, Steph, with the Eastern Conference, anyone can win. I think in this conference, even down you know at, the, at that second wild card spot, the Washington Capitals. I'm not super crazy about them, but would I be shocked if they won a round or two? Probably not, just because the East is such a gauntlet. You know, yep. it's there's going to be four really good teams that fail that fall in round one. I'm hoping that the Penguins are not one of them, but you know, they, you know, this is a team that's they've been playing really well all year. And I think it's about time, you know, more and more national media talk about them. But also I think at the same time, I kind of want people to also talk about Florida and Carolina and them and not, you know, see the Penguins as that top contender. Yeah. I'm, I'm right in the same boat with the wilds, you know, in the midst of one of the best seasons their franchise has ever had. And yet, mm-hmm. Here's Colorado. Here's Calgary. So it it is one of those things where, you know, some of the attention is nice, but you also want to just let your team kind of do their thing in the weeds and pounce when the time is right. So I'm I'm right there with you on that. Trade deadline wise, uh, the Wild and the Penguins were both uh, a couple of the biggest buyers um, at the deadline. And uh, from the Penguin standpoint, Ricard Raquel, Obviously, the big prize for them at the deadline. What does Raquel bring to the Penguins? What has he brought? And uh, you know, just just talk us through the uh, the trade deadline a little bit. Yeah. So you know, I think a lot of the fan base and you know, even some of the Penguins media, you know, myself included, and a couple other writers, you know, we were we were hoping that Ron was actually going to go out and make a move. I know it's not his thing. He's usually very patient, doesn't like to do much. That's how he was in Philadelphia, but. You know, who's to say someone can't change in a different situation? And, you know, he went against his way, I think, a little bit and saw that this team should be rewarded with a move. 
and he went out and, you know, did exactly that. He goes out and gets Ricard Raquel from the Ducks. They give up a second round pick, which I don't really care about. Callie Klang, a good goaltender prospect, which is, you know, that's fine, but they have Tristan Jari for many more years. Zach Ashton Reese, a very good defensive player, but wasn't bringing a lot of offense this year. And a 13th or 14th forward than Dominic Simone. I would do, I will do that deal any day of the week. And Raquel has been awesome ever since coming over, scored his first goal in that 11 to 2 route of the Detroit Red Wings on Sunday. That's the first team in the salary cap era the Penguins are to score more than 10 goals um, in a game. And, you know, one thing that really jumps out at me, which what I didn't think would, was he's a lot more physical than I thought he would be. He's actually a player on this team that will go out and finish checks um, because the Penguins, they're not a team that's going to, you know, bully you around. I mean, and I've been saying that a lot these last couple of days. I know that's probably not what Brian Burke wants them to do, but you know what? This is Mike Sullivan's team and he wants to play a speed and skill game. But, you know, he's also just very crafty with the puck. You know, on multiple occasions, he's come in and challenged teams one-on-three, one-on-four, and has gained the, the zone with ease, has a wicked shot. Um, he's looked great next to Evgeny Malkin these last couple of games. It looks like he's going to stay on that line with Gino against Minnesota, and they're putting Jason Zucker next to him. So I'm curious to see how that line is going to do because Zucker has played well with Malkin in the past, and, you know, with how Raquel is as well, I think he complements both those players uh, pretty good. So um, he honestly could have more than one goal right now. Um, his underlying numbers have been great ever since coming over. I know this is technically right now a rental because he's not signed after the year. Um, though with how he's going, I wouldn't be surprised if they did try to lock him up, even though the salary cap situation is definitely – the Penguins are going to go through the motions with that. that that's for sure. Um, yeah. This is the team that's always up against the cap, and they have – Harder decisions, to say the least, um, over Ricard Raquel. Um, but it, 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 they needed another forward, especially for Evgeny Malkin's wing. There were so many players coming in and off that line. Brock McGinn, Dan Heinen, Captain Rodriguez, Brian Russ. He's now moved up to the top line. So they needed that right winger that's going to stay with him and produce next to him. And I think they've gotten exactly that, and it makes their top six that much more formidable. You talked about old friend Jason Zucker, who will make his return to the lineup, will make his return to Minnesota. Was I, I loved Jason Zucker when he was here. Um, was a guy that always had no trouble scoring the puck. It just it seemed like he was part of that nucleus with Chuck Fletcher that hit their ceiling and struggled to go up and above it. And so, you know, in there's been enough time that has passed for Zucker playing in Pittsburgh. Just how much has he endeared himself to Penguins fans since he was traded to the Penguins? Well, um, <laughs> it, it, it's, there's been disappointment at times because he hasn't produced. Um, he has always good metrics. That's the thing. It's just the puck hasn't gone in the back of the net. Honestly, in the playoffs last year, he's probably one of their best players. Against the Islanders, had a couple goals. Even this year, um, he's just been banked up. Um, comes back from a hernia, Seth, plays through it because he re-injured himself in that game, scores two goals against the, the Vegas Golden Knights. This was back in January. Um, comes back out, then misses the next 30-plus games with a hernia. He's been out nine weeks. Um, and that's just an injury that you can't play through. And he had to go undergo surgery. He's been skating a lot these last couple of weeks. Um, but I do think he is going to make a difference when he returns. I know some fans, some Penguins fans don't believe me when I say that, but he's one of their best four checkers. He'll go to the dirty areas and, you know, make life easy on Evgeny Malkin. He has a great shot. His playmaking ability is also really good. I am, I am still a believer in this player. Um, he, he makes their depth that much better. And, you know, you can put him on the second power play. You can play him in the top six, which is what they're going to do. And th they have missed him this season it's just it hasn't been the same with him out of the lineup and hopefully he'll be able to stay healthy down the stretch here um and then into the playoffs and i also think he does have one more year left on his contract going to next year i'm not sure if he's going to stay on the team in the offseason just because of that massive cap hit 5.5 million but you know i'm still holding out hope for him um to say the least and i'm hoping set that he gets a rocking ovation when he goes back to minnesota tomorrow night because i'll be the first time he plays in that building and i'm sure He's probably going to get a nice tribute video because, you know, I've seen the the, the the two massive playoff goals. I think that one of them come to mind. I think it was the, the game three overtime winner against Chicago in 2013, that if my memory serves me right, and a couple other, of course, a bunch of other massive goals. And I know his wife was very endeared in the community and stuff. So I'm really I'm 
I'm excited to see how um, the reception is for him there. Oh yeah, it'll be it'll be a very big, uh, very warm. Minnesota does it right with player returns. Like he'll get a great ovation and a, a great tribute from the Wild. So that uh, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, let's flip things and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the Minnesota Wild. I'll give Hunter a chance to uh, to throw some wild questions at me when we continue today's crossover episode of Locked on Wild and Locked on Penguins after this. Continuing today's episode of Locked on Wild and Locked on Penguins. Once again, thank you for making both shows your first listen every day. All right, Hunter, I will uh, I'll step into the, the question chair. I'm an open book. Whatever you got, wild-related. Hit me with it. Yeah, so Seth, I, I I can't help but notice. Obviously, the Wild have been one of the best teams in hockey as of late. Um, one, I believe it's what seven in a row right now. If my memory, yep. If my, if I, yep. I had to make sure I had that in my notes here. <laughs> um, you know, they're I think they're quietly asserting themselves as definitely a dark horse in the Western Conference. I know Colorado is the team to beat. That's going to be a very tough seven game series against them. Calgary is also right up there. And then after that, you know, you look at the rest of the teams, you know, Los Angeles, Edmonton, Dallas, Nashville, St. Louis, Vegas, obviously, though they're barely even in a playoff spot right now. But I would have the Minnesota Wild at that three spot in the Western Conference. Um, How confident are you um, in this team that they can make a deep run? Um, I'll get to Mark andre Fleury in just a second, Um, even though those two juggernauts are controlling the Western Conference right now. You know, I I think this is a team that's definitely capable of winning a couple of series, you know, winning a series at least, and uh, going with everything they have against the Colorado Avalanche in that uh, that's likely second round. Uh, and it is largely in part to uh, former Penguin Bill Guerin, who is putting this team together, and all the success that he has had throughout uh, his playing career he is trying to you know emulate those types of teams here in Minnesota and a couple of the biggest reasons that the wild had as much of a skid as they did where they had a two and eight stretch and scuffled coming out of the break uh, in the second half was largely in part to just being kind of muscled around by their opponents you know we saw it happen against Calgary a couple of times Florida uh Winnipeg and uh, and Dallas as well, and Nashville in that mix also. Just teams kind of being more physical and pushing the wild around um, up and down the ice. So enter the likes of Nick Delorier and Jacob Middleton, who have – I I have just a, a genius metaphor that can explain just what they have been doing uh, for this team. So you are moving – you're moving from – where you currently live to somewhere else. And so you get a U-Haul and you're throwing everything that you own in the back of a U-Haul. And then you have two like baby grand, just massive pianos that you have to move as well. You're not going to chain those up though. Like you're not going to secure those. You're just going to let them go and just let them be untethered in the back of the truck. And they're just moving around, absolutely blowing up anything that they run into. That's exactly what Middleton and Delorier have brought. They're just <laughs> they're huge bodies. And, you know, I have been really impressed with what Jacob Middleton has brought to this team because he hits very hard and he plays really good defense. And I think the shot that a lot of wild fans will take from however long Nick Delorier ends up being here is what happened against the Flyers where he uh, ended up fighting and he got cut open. I think the bridge of his nose got cut open. And so there's just, there's blood everywhere. And he like looked like Gene Simmons from Kiss. He had his tongue out and was like, had kind of one of those maniacal smiles. But I think that's exactly what this wild team needed was a little bit of an edge to him, a little bit of identity. Um, I think Bill Guerin used the exact words, bite and fight. And so now that they've had that, they have been able to play that really physical, that grinding style playoff hockey that you need in order to wear teams down and uh, take advantage of opportunities. They got the two really good scoring lines. They got the grief line. That's one of the best defensive lines in hockey. And now they have an enforcer line with Brandon Duhame, Tyson Jost, and Nick Delorier. 
it's it's a team that is rolling and it's a team I think that is invigorated by the trades and I think is fully capable of uh, of being dangerous come playoff time. It would not shock me one bit if the Wild not only win one playoff series but they find a way to shock somebody in that second round. Yeah, I think Minnesota can definitely take down St. Louis. I know they've had a good year. Nashville, I, I like them, and they've, their stars have actually produced. Um, but I, I'm I'm not sure um, if they can be Minnesota. The only team in that division that would scare me is obviously Colorado when they're fully healthy. They right. they can ice the best the, the probably the best quintet in hockey uh, with Landis Gall, Granson, and McKinnon, and then freaking uh, Devon Taves and Kel McCarr if they want to, just because that that's they can do that. But you know, switching gears a little bit, Seth. You know, they the, Minnesota surprised me by going out and getting old friend Mark Andre Fleury, finally rescuing him from the hellhole that is the Chicago Blackhawks this year. <laughs> um, that team is dreadful, and I am glad that he is out of there for the stretch one, and he can maybe make one more Stanley Cup uh, run before he has to make a decision at the end of this year. He's a UFA. I'm not really sure what he's going to do. Um, the Billy Garen connection is was definitely evident. He was there in Pittsburgh. Um, for a lot of Flurry's years um, there. And, you know, they actually won all three Stanley Cups together. Billy Garen was on the team in 2009 when they went out and acquired him. And, you know, Flurry was the goalie. And then obviously he was the assistant general manager, Jim Rutherford, before taking Minnesota's job. Um, were you expecting the Wild to make that move? Because was I don't, I don't know if Cam Talbot was really struggling or, or and whatnot, but, you know, were you wanting them to go out and get another goalie? And, and how do you feel about it now that he's had one start? under his belt yeah you know it was such a it was such an odd thing because i found myself really combing through because so there are two sides of the argument so it could either be that the goalies are not playing well or that they are playing with a bad defense in front of them and i wasn't sure which way to lean with flurry in chicago i felt like there were parts of both of those coins uh in play but with the Wild, too, you know, it felt like both the defense and the goaltending got bad during that 2-8 and eight stretch at the same time. And so, you know, Talbot didn't necessarily do the team any favors during that stretch, but the defense didn't help him out either. And so I was like, you know, do we just does the defense just need to play better or do we truly need some help in the goalie position? And, you know, it's obviously with hindsight. I'm fully in favor of the move now because I think it's done two things. Obviously, it's pretty apparent that Marc-Andre Fleury still has something left in the tank. And I think a lot of the issues that made his over his underlying numbers were pretty good. The I think the thing that made his numbers overall look meh is that defense that was playing in front of him. I don't yeah. think that Chicago defense was really good at all. And so he comes in, and he has looked really good so far uh, with the Wild. He had, you know, he just had those fun electric, like he had the windmill save against the Flyers, and uh, he just he looks confident, and he just he brings like flair and pizzazz with him when he's between the pipes. But there was a byproduct to this trade that I don't think anybody anticipated. Cam Talbot, I think for the first time this season, has felt some pressure. Oh, yeah. And that, hey, if I don't step my game up, I'm going to end up being the backup. And so for the first time all season, because with with Capo Kakinen, you know, he he did a good job here. But it was pretty evident that he was always going to be the backup to Cam Talbot. And so if Talbot struggled, he was still going to get opportunities to get himself righted. With Flurry now. If Talbot has a stretch where he scuffles, Flurry's going to hop in and take a majority of those starts. And so I think Talbot has felt that pressure in a good way to up his performance. And with Flurry also playing well, it gives this team a, a goalie combo that I think they can effectively use. You know, I've been thinking too about like, what do you do in the playoffs? I think you can put a platoon together. With as good as Cam Talbot has been at the X, I think you can put him in as the home starter. You can throw Flurry in on the road. He has done a lot of that throughout his career. You can throw him in for a road playoff game, I think, and be just fine. So it gives this team a goalie combo that 
is two effective starters that the Wild can use. Now, let's say one of the goalies gets shelled in the first game of a playoff series. Then that's another change of pace you can throw, too, is you can say, hey, we're going to go to the other guy for game two. So I think it just it gives them options, and I think it has unlocked something in Cam Talbot by forcing him to be on his best because if he is not, you got a future Hall of Famer behind him. Yeah, uh, th- 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 that to say the least. I- I'm sure, honestly, he probably will start game one. I don't feel like you go out and get someone like that and you ride on yeah. the bench, though. I mean, I-, I will say, I know he did was behind Matt Murray for a couple of runs, though he did start the first half of 2017 before um, Matt Murray supplanted him. Um, but, you know, another player before we get to a commercial break here, Seth, that obviously, you know, he's the talk of the wild. And one of my favorite players to watch is Kirill Kaprizov. I mean, what a. What a talent he is. I know some people clowned that extension that he uh, signed um, in the offseason just because it was a small sample size. Like, you're giving that guy a lot of money. It was a shortened season. Um, he has put those naysayers to bed. Um, 82 points, I believe, in 64 games right now. I mean, it would not be surprised me if he does hit 100 by the end of the year. Um, what a talent he is. And um, I, I just – whenever I see the Wild, you know, or on TV, I will put them on just because I love watching him. Um, you know, just – what does he mean, you know, to that team, especially, you know, this season as they want to contend and, you know, moving forward, especially because I know the wild have a cap crunch coming um, yeah. for a couple of, um, I believe Seth, it's the Parise and Suter situations. And yep. I think, I, I, I don't know if there's any more to it than that, but you know, just, you know, talk about his season that he's having and just why he's such a threat every shift. Well, Kirill Kaprizov is, you know, we, we use this term in sports periodically for just someone that is so unique and so different compared to what you're used to. Kirill Kaprizov is a unicorn, not only in <laughs> Minnesota Wild franchise history, but in like Minnesota sports history. This is a team that has always had players on the roster that they are hoping can kind of overachieve. Um but they've never been a team that's really been geared towards offense. We had Marion Gabrick, sure. And he was a incredibly good goal scorer. But you look at the things that Kaprizov does on the ice, skating around the entirety of a, a team zone, weaving his way through traffic with the puck and scoring goals by himself. That wraparound goal that he scored on Drew Doughty and the rest of the LA Kings I think is a goal that a lot of teams are going to have nightmares about for a long time. He's just such a pure gifted in every way. Skater, gifted skater, gifted passer, gifted playmaker. He has the entire package in one body. And I think the thing that really surprised me the most about him this year is that we saw in the series against the golden Knights, the playoffs, Teams really tried to be physical with him to slow him down and frustrate him. And he has added to that this year. Like he is not afraid to be physical with teams. There have been some times where somebody slides in to try to, uh, to knock him down and he will plant them. Like he is not afraid to mix it up with, with opponents. And I think that has just was the one piece that he was maybe hadn't fully showcased um, in his game. And, you know, he's he's in year two of his NHL career, and he already looks like one of the best players in the entire league. Mm-hmm. He has room to grow still. And so it's frightening to me in a good way to think just where he will be able to go with his career because the Wild just have not had this type of player in their existence. They've had, they've had nice players, you know, Zach Parisi, had good years here, but he was never that type of player. He was always, you know, he's he was always a scorer, but more of a second option. Never a guy that can, like, truly win a game for you. And Kirill Kaprizov can do that and then some. So he is he's far and away the best player the Wild have ever had already. And he's only going to add to that as we go. It's just... It blows my mind, and we're just going to continue to see it here over the next you know, four more oh, next four years. Yeah, he's such a special talent. I always read from the Wild fans, you know, we keep waiting, keep we're going to keep waiting for him, keep waiting for him. And 
Uh, he has delivered uh, and then some so far, and I definitely think he's only going to get better at this point. Um, coming up in the next segment, we're going to fully preview this game uh, between these two teams and, you know, maybe also look back at that, you know, last game to see, you know, maybe that's a blueprint for how this one could go as well. So stick around for that coming up here in this final segment. All right, so we're back here on this special crossover edition of Locked on Wild and Locked on Penguins. I'm Hunter Hodes. That is Seth Topol. So, Seth, this game, I'm, it promises to be great. You know, last game, I remember the Penguins were up two with less than five minutes left, and they gave up basically a buzzer beater, which is something that I don't, I don't think the Penguins have given up in the third period since then. Now, Ryan Hartman tied it with about th two or three seconds left while ended up winning in a shootout. Um, there was no goals in overtime. That was the, when the Penguins were really struggling in shootouts. Um, but that was a game the Penguins should have won. They were pretty banged up at that point, but they had a two-goal lead with less than five minutes to go. Absolutely stopped playing in six-on-five situations. They've been a lot better since then there. Um, but now I, I always like looking at, you know, what the potential line combinations and all that. And, you know, this, this is a deep Minnesota team. You know, Matt Zuccarello has – lifted his game way up from where he was in New York. I always thought that he was a pretty good player with the Rangers, but I think he's turned into a great player now um, in Minnesota. Um, Kevin Fiala has been great. Um, Ryan Hartman, I think, has come out of nowhere, and I think has definitely really surprised some people. Um, I've noticed that Fred Freddie Goudreau is getting a lot more ice time as well, former Penguin. Of course, he played on the fourth line last year. Um Joel Erickson Eck is one of my personal favorite players um, in the full, in the National Hockey League. He, he has that massive extension, which, you know, some people laughed at, but I thought it was good value because he's one of the best defensive centers in the league. Mm -hmm. And when he also contributes offense to it, it makes it look like a really good deal, despite it being um, a max term kind of deal. And, you know, Jared Spurgeon, Jonas Brodeen, Matt Dumba, you know, they're all very solid defensive players. Um, defenseman, you know, the, and you know, especially in Spurgeon's case, I've always loved watching him too. Um, what are you really looking for in this one, Seth? I guess like some keys to the game for you, um, in order for the Wild to win because this is a daunting stretcher for the Penguins. They go here to Denver, back home to play Colorado again, to play, then they go to Madison Square Garden, then I believe they have Nashville and Washington, and it's just a brutal stretch. Jeez, um. In terms of keys for this game, it's pretty simple for me. Um, I, I continue to absolutely despise, despite the fact that it has had success over the last few games, I cannot, I cannot say enough how much I do not like what the Wild are doing on the power play. Um, because they're doing the thing, and it seems like they've started to go away from this, which is great. They're doing the thing where they just say, hey, we're going to take like our starting forward line and our starting defense line and just put that on the power play. And I hate it so much. I think they're starting to move away from it, though, thankfully. But it's a power play that passes too much, shoots too little, mm -hmm. struggles to even get the puck into the zone. And so special teams are a huge key for me because the Wilder, the Wilder, going to have opportunities on the power play. They're going to have to capitalize on them. The penalty kill has still given up some goals here recently, but I thought the penalty kill has actually turned a corner this season. They have started to attack teams as they enter the uh, the Wilds defensive zone. Like they had converge on them as they bring the puck in. So even just that little bit of aggression has led to the penalty kill looking like it actually knows what it's doing. Um, beyond that, it's just going to be seeing this wild team do what they did to Vancouver, to Columbus, to Colorado is just use that newly found physicality, wear teams down. And then when you get your opportunity late in the game or in overtime, capitalize on it. That's, that's the biggest key. I think for me is treat this like a playoff game and, um, do the th just just stick to the things that the Wild have been doing so well here over the stretch is just playing the style of hockey that they went out to try to acquire. Stay true to that, and Cam Talbot's going to be a net, it sounds like. So for Talbot, continue to ride this hot stretch. Keep that confidence going, and uh, 
I, I think this is a wild team that right now is capable of beating anybody. Yeah, I mean, it would certainly appear that way with how they keep playing here. Um, you know, the Penguins special teams, they've been pretty good. You know, for most of the season, the power play has gotten much better as of late. They were in like a massive one for 21 funk with everyone back, but they've scored power play goal in five of their last six or seven games. The penalty kill has been top three um, all year. A lot of that is due to Teddy Bluger. Um, and he's just, he's a tremendous penalty killer. So um, the, the special teams battle, it should be interesting. You know, I, you said Minnesota power play is, Struggled, it sounds like, for a good chunk of this year. You know, going up against a top PK, that I guess should be an interesting matchup. You know, for the Penguins, you know, we, we have a thing, you know, on Penguins Twitter and uh, other places, Seth, called we do the vibe check for the first five minutes. And we like to see, you know, usually we can tell through the first five minutes if they're going to win or if they're going to lose. And, you know, about 90% of the time, we'll write the other 10%, you know, we're not going to talk about it. So that's, I think, going to be a big thing for the Penguins tomorrow. You know, they're, they're in a stretch here where they're playing all these playoff teams. These are basically playoff games. You are being prepared for what's going to be coming in about five weeks. So, you know, they have to start fast, really forecheck aggressively, play Mike Sullivan's system to a T. They got to get some saves from Tristan Jari because I'm sure Minnesota is going to come out, you know, pretty spirited with how they've been playing uh, lately. And I assume Tristan Jari will start this game. Um, this is a massive game. I don't think they're going to throw Casey to Smith out there. Um, in my opinion. Um, you know, I'll also be curious to see if the depth scoring continues to stay hot. Um, for the last the last 10 days, about almost two weeks now, um, it's really, you know, woken up again. Danton Heinen is like you know, close to 15 goals. Jeff Carter's been playing better. Kasperi Kaplan has actually been playing his best hockey of the season. Brian Boyle is almost up to 10 goals as a fourth liner. So um, I think that's a big key for me um, as well. But you know, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, it's been a while since these two teams played. I think they played. Like I said, like back in October, November, when the season was just getting started. Um, so this is a long time coming, and we finally get to see these two teams play. And this is also one of the Penguins' final games against a Western Conference team um, this year. Other than wow. this, they only have the two games they played, Colorado twice, um, and all their other games are against Eastern Conference teams hmm. uh, the rest of the way uh, after looking at the schedule. They have 14 games left. Um, they, they got a lot of the Western games done in the first half of the season. So I'm um, just really excited. Uh, to, to to watch this one, that's for sure. Yeah, 100%. You know, the, a couple of other things that I'll say just to wrap up on the wild end. It seems like teams have been trying to slow down the Kevin Fiala, Matt Boldy, Freddie Goudreau line more recently, which is why you got to have two lines at least that can adequately score. We've seen an uptick in the Kirill Kaprizov, Ryan Hartman, Matt Zuccarello line over the past few games. And so I look for that to continue. It's it's such a double-edged sword for opponents because, you know, yeah, in theory, it makes sense to go try to stop Kirill Kaprizov, but then you got Kevin Fiala kind of running free doing his thing. And so teams flipped it, and now Kaprizov is going nuts again. Um, Nick Delorier did get his first fight in a wild uniform out of the way against the Flyers. So that was one thing that I... Thank you for knocking them out of the playoffs, by the way. That was yeah. very funny. Of course. And it, of course it, it happened with Chuck Fletcher and Mike Yo um, running that team. So happy to do it. But like, not that I was worried per se, because, you know, that's what Deloria was brought in to do was be physical and oh, yeah. to um, lay some justice. But you do like now that it's now that it's out of the way, like some of those first fight jitters are uh, are out the window for <laughs> Deloria. Um, so it's it's going to be a, just an amazing uh, game between these two teams and obviously looking forward to uh, to it starting. So can't wait, as uh, as Bart Scott said for the New York Jets. Can't wait. I, I can't do his voice, but, you know. <laughs> can't uh, wait. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah there, there it is. Um, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be great. You know, again, this is such a brutal stretch for the Penguins here, the gauntlet as I like to call it. The last day had a seven-game stretch uh, about a few weeks ago where they played Carolina twice, Tampa Bay, I believe St. Louis, Nashville, um, Vegas. And I think um, I'm forgetting the other team. They went four and two and one. So they played pretty well against some of the league's best teams. You know, they, they, they lost the first one against the Rangers. We'll have to see how they do. Um, and this one, the Penguins are one of the best road teams in the league, you know, metrics-wise as well, expected goals against, total goals against, goals for. Um, so that's also, I think, a big thing to look at too. 
Um, Seth, I do not have the thing to obviously click here to end it or anything, <laughs> but uh, we're going to keep that in the show, um, by the way. But I can't, I can't wait to watch it. And, you know, for those that are on the screen, you know, you can follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. The show's Twitter is at LO underscore Penguins, and you can find the Lockdown Penguins podcast, as Seth said at the beginning of the show, wherever you get podcasts. And make sure to follow Locked on Wild wherever you listen as well. And follow me, there we go, at Seth, T-O-U-P-S, on Twitter. Both shows free and available wherever you listen. Both shows bringing you new episodes every Monday through Friday. And both shows are part of the Locked on Podcast Network.